Welcome to the Academy webinar today to talk about the 2021 fellowship application process, some key changes and insight. I'm Dr. Jane Swanson and I'm the chair for the selection committee for 2021. And joining us today um, is Dr. Ken White, our president elect, who's gonna talk about some of these changes and also uh, Dr. Linda Scott, with, who's been on the review committee for changes to the fellowship committee, and Dr. David Capnew, who, who was last year's chair for the selection committee and is advisor to this year's group. Um, there's a few important dates that I wanna remind everybody of that on the call. Applications, will open on January the 19th for the online application. Um, one of the things that we're probably gonna stress during this webinar is please read the directions carefully because there are word limits for the different sections and there's also a page limit for the number of pages for your uh, curricula vitae. And one of the reasons why we stick to those closely is so everyone has an equal opportunity when they're filling out their applications to provide the information. Um, the other thing is the deadline for the application is February the 19th, 2021. And as you probably are well aware, having submitted many online applications for different conference, um, abstracts, it's best not to wait to the last day when a lot, a lot of people are trying to submit. Because Sometimes the uh, submission process can get a little overloaded and it can slow down. So try not to wait till that very, very last day to submit. Um, as you know, the Fellowship Selection Committee is one of the standing committees of the Academy. And Individuals are elected or appointed to that committee. Normally there are four members elected each year for a three year term. And then the board of directors of the academy also will um, uh, appoint some members to help with our diversity and also the diversity of backgrounds of the members on the selection committee. Of the 18 members on the selection committee, the, the 16 members that are reviewing and the co-chair and the, um, the chair, plus the advisor, we come from a variety of backgrounds of practice, service, government, academia, um, consulting, entrepreneurial backgrounds. So we try to have a diversity. And David's gonna talk a little bit more about those um, those dyads. But right now, let's go to Dr. Ken White and let him talk about some of the changes for this 2021. Ken? Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And I'd like to welcome all of you to this information webinar about the fellow selection process. I'm also uh, very happy to be serving on the board of the American Academy of Nursing. And the lifeblood of our academy is um, recruiting and uh, inducting new members. And so it's very important uh, that uh, you have the information you need and uh, we give you the, the guidance in, in applying for the academy. I also wanna, wanna say that as part of our continuing process of quality improvement, um, we are looking at all of our operations and, and um, governance structures. And we're looking at the process for fellow selection, the application, and we've made some, uh, uh, some changes that will be in effect in, in uh, 2021. So I'd like to go through some of those changes and, and make sure that, that um, you take note because your sponsors and other people who um, you might be communicating with may not be fully aware of, of some of these changes that are being uh, put into place. The first change is, <clears throat> of course, you know that you have to have uh, two sponsors and the purpose of your sponsors is to augment, clarify, and um, uh, support your application based on their uh, ability, 
um, to assess and evaluate uh, your contribution to nursing. We also, uh, we pay attention, the Fellow Selection Committee, which I served on for three years, uh, pays a lot of attention to the sponsor statements, but we have decided uh, uh, there's a, 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 a committee that has been um, reviewing the processes of Fellow Selection, made the recommendation to the board, and it was approved that we would blind the sponsor. So as part of the review, when the Fellow Selection Committee looks at your uh, application, uh, the, the information about the individual sponsors will not be available to the committee members. So that's the first, uh, the first change. The second, uh, it's, it's not really, it's a change, but it's, it's really in keeping with um, a continuing education focus of, uh, of our um, quality improvement efforts. And that is each member of the fellow selection committee, as well as the staff will, will undergo pretty extensive uh, un unconscious bias training. Uh, that will happen in the beginning of the process uh, before any committee members uh, are um, uh, have information about the applicants. The third um, area that, that we are um, working on to improve the process is to develop some exemplars. In the past, we've had an exemplar that's been posted on the website for an application, but that exemplar, I believe, was uh, um, slanted more toward an acad academic applicant. So we're, we're making others um, so that we will have guides and a pretty extensive work by our staff and, and our fellows uh, putting this together. So I think we're hoping that that will be a great resource for you and it will be helpful as you put together uh, the final touches of your application. I just wanna say one last thing that um, in addition to who being inducted, which is an incredible honor in, in nursing uh, in our world, uh, where uh, we have about 2,700 fellows and about 13% uh, of those are from around the world representing uh, 35 countries. That's a big deal uh, to be inducted in the academy, but that's not where it ends. We're hoping that uh, you will convey in your application and you will honestly uh, be committed to uh, helping us with our vision and our goals uh, of the Academy and our three signature initiatives, which are uh, the Council for Advancement of Nursing Science, or CANS, the Institute for Nursing Leadership, and our Edge Runners uh, Program for Innovation in, in Nursing. Undergirding all of this, of course, is our contribution to patient care and health and health care and the implications for policy. So if you have uh, done work with policy implications, be sure that you um, specify that. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from Linda and our other uh, panelists uh, who can give you more information. So Dr. Scott, let me give it to you. Thank you, Ken, and good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure to be here to share some insights with you into the fellow selection process. My goal today is to share four recommendations that come from my experience and perspective as a fellow in the, the Academy since 2008, and as both a member and chair of the fellow selection committee for several years, and now as a part of the uh, review committee that's looking at the process. Um, our goal really is to um, achieve a greater diversity among the fellows, both demographically and those from varying pro uh, professional backgrounds. We know that we have 21 million nurses around the globe, and yet less than 3,000 of them are fellows in the, in the academy. We know that there are many more nurses that meet the criteria for induction or have the potential for meeting it in the future. So that's where I'm gonna spend a little bit of my time talking about. Um, Ken shared with you uh, plan changes for the upcoming review cycle. What has not changed are the criteria for selection. And there are two things. One, an individual must demonstrate consistent, outstanding contributions to nursing and healthcare and its measurable impact. And two, the potential to continue to contribute to nursing and to advance the mission and vision of the academy. So my first area that I wanna talk about is a misperception about these criteria 
and that is that they cannot be achieved until later in one's nursing career. So this myth impacts the diversity of the academy, especially from an age perspective. It's important for prospective candidates to know that uh, fellowship in the academy is not the end of a career honor and that consistent sustained contribution and impact can be achieved at earlier points in one's career. So my first recommendation would be for interested applicants to complete the pre-application self-assessment worksheet that can be found on the Academy website. This worksheet can help guide uh, an assessment of impact and can serve as a foundation to completing a fellow application. It would also help um, potential sponsors to ascertain the applicant's readiness for fellowship consideration. I think if you take the worksheet and you couple it with a uh, one CV or resume um, that documents measurable impact, that will also help sponsors to determine whether or not you're, you're ready for uh, uh, fellowship. But if not, it can serve as a roadmap for things that you can do to continue um, to guide your career and um, establish uh, the evidence that you need for uh, fellowship consideration. So it's, it indeed is a, a good investment of time and conversation for all interested applicants, um, especially those who are early in their careers. I think the same process can be useful for individuals from diverse backgrounds and areas of professional practice to determine their uh, contribution and impact. So now a second strategy for success and support is the selection of sponsors themselves. Each application requires two sponsors who, can, who provide narrative statements that effectively amplify the applicant's um, contributions. Now, most fellows would say um, that they need to know the applicant um, exceptionally well to guide them through the application process. And likewise, they would say that it's an iterative process between the applicant and the two sponsors to achieve a level of application of the applicant's contribution without redundancy or overstatement. But to achieve this, it does require commitment and collaboration um, among all three individuals that typically occurs over a three to six month period. This is not something that um, as some of our students may say, oh, I have a paper due the next day and I'll start writing it the night before. This is indeed a process that requires um, time commitment and investment. Um, and I think it's also important to note that working with individuals early will again help to assess that readiness and um, sponsors then can take on more of a mentorship advisory role to help individuals um, to uh, uh, put together a robust application. So bottom line between an applicant and um, sponsors is there really does need to be a good fit. Um, some people will say that um, they don't know any fellows or how can they actually um, identify a sponsor. So I would encourage uh, prospective applicants to attend the academy conferences, um, and to network with current fellows um, who may belong to other professional organizations that, that um, you may be a member of, as well as alumni associations so that you can meet potential sponsors and they can get to know you. Um, this is also particularly true um, for individuals who may be geographically distant from Academy Fellows. Do whatever you can to be able to uh, get to know members of the academy and for the academy fellows to get to know you. I would also say that it's important to remember that it's not who the sponsor is, but how you partner with your sponsor in order to prepare your, uh, your application that meets the required uh, criteria for induction. My third recommendation is for our fellows themselves who belong to other professional organizations and networks with predominantly people of color or indigenous populations to begin to identify and mentor those who have the potential for or who are on a trajectory for um, the pathway to the academy. 
with early identification and support in navigating the process that would help to uh, facilitate racial ethnic diversity within the academy. And then I would say in my last area that the academy does have more fellows who are practicing in an academic or service role um, than what may be considered non-traditional positions. Yet we do know that there are many nurses who are working in government, policy, military, and entrepreneurial positions who are having significant impact. We would like those individuals to consider academy fellowship as well. So my fourth recommendation is that these individuals access the resources available on the academy website, which will also soon to expand as Ken mentioned to um, include exemplar impact statements um, from other nursing roles and to complete the pre-application self-assessment. By following these recommendations, we believe that the Academy of the American Academy of Nursing can indeed diversify its fellowship. So thank you for allowing me to share those comments and I will now turn it over to our colleague, David uh, Keith News, please. Thank you. Okay, I had, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, I, should, I should be used to these things by now. Um, so thank you, Linda. And what I'd like to do is to speak fairly briefly about the process that the Fellow Selection Committee follows in reviewing applications and making decisions. Uh, you've heard from Jane Swanson, among, among others, who serves as chair of the FSC this year, and her co-chair is uh, Debbie Chapman Bryant. I served as FSC chair last year. My function this year is to serve as uh, advisor uh, to the committee. Um, as you heard, under the Academy bylaws, the fellow selection committee consists of 18 members, 12 are elected, six are appointed uh, by the board. Each member serves a three-year term with four members elected to appointed each year. Now, after applications are submitted and before the review process begins, the Academy staff receives them and they check to make sure that the applications are consistent with all requirements. So I know this should go without saying, but it's incumbent on each candidate and her or his sponsors uh, to make sure that they've read and followed the instructions. I know that sounds way too simple to mention, but I wouldn't be mentioning it if it weren't a problem with a few applications each year. So please pay careful attention to the word count for each component of the application. Pay attention to the length of the candidate's CV, which can't be any longer than 20 pages. Sometimes one will come in that's 21 pages, sometimes much longer. Uh, please don't do that. Uh, the instructions also include guidance on uh, items uh, not to include in the CV. So again, look at the instructions. Also keep in mind that a candidate uh, located in the US must be a member of the American Nurses Association. If a candidate lives and works in another country, uh, she or he must be a member of that country's affiliate of the International Council of Nurses, the National Nurses Association, um, if there is one. This is sometimes a point of confusion um, for applicants from other countries. Sometimes candidates will list their affiliation with their state or provincial, uh, provincial licensing authority rather than the uh, professional association. So just pay careful attention to the instructions. It's really unfortunate when an application has to be uh, turned down uh, just based on non-substantive reasons. Now, before the review process starts, the chair and the co-chair assign each FSC member to a dyad, so a team of two. There are 18 members, including the chair and co-chair, so that means 16 members doing the initial reviews uh, in eight dyads. And the effort is to pair up an, a new FSC member with an experienced one, and also to have some degree of role diversity, which usually means pairing an academic with a non-academic once the co-chairs uh, receive the applications, uh, first the list is sent out to FSC members so they can uh, declare any conflicts of interest with any of the candidates. And the co-chairs uh, divide the applicants up between the dyads. So with eight dyads, each are reviewing one eighth of the applications. So last year, each dyad had 40 something, it was either 43 or 46 um, applications to review. Uh, that 
number will probably increase. We'll see this year. And of course, the assignments avoid uh, assigning someone uh, to a dyad if, if there's a conflict of interest. Um, the dyads then work together. Um, usually the timeline allows about uh, a month and a half to um, review their assigned candidates based on the criteria that uh, Linda has explained. So the application should be clear in reflecting the candidate's impact. And it's really important that the candidate statement, the sponsor statement, and the candidate CV are consistent with each other. And that doesn't mean repeating the same information over and over again. It does mean reinforcing what's in the candidate's statement. Sometimes a sponsor statement will just be a general statement of endorsement without any real specifics. That's not helpful. Uh, sometimes a sponsor statement will focus on contributions that aren't reflected in the candidate statement or the candidate statement uh, will include uh, contributions or focus on contributions that aren't reflected in the CV. Uh, again, not helpful. The, the basic point is that the application is a package and everything should fit together. And this really requires, as you've heard, uh, the applicant and the sponsors to work together as a team. So the dyads work together to review and discuss each application. They rate each one of them. A one is a recommendation to approve uh, the application. A three is a recommendation not to approve and a two is uh, neither. Either the dyad uh, members can't agree or they're truly unsure or they feel that more discussion is needed. Uh, the co-chairs will usually encourage the dyads to make a recommendation on each candidate, a one or a three, but there are clearly many valid reasons for giving a two, and that's the, the initial decision, and that's what it is. In the meantime, the chair and the co-chair each review every application. Yes, I said every application. Um, after the dyad's recommendations are received, the chair and the co-chair review their recommendations along with the dyad's recommendations. If there is consensus among all reviewers on either approving or not approving, we go with that decision. If there's not consensus, uh, the co-chairs will let the dyads know, invite them to review the applications again where there isn't consensus. The idea here isn't to pressure anybody into agreeing, but rather to re-review. We're all working from the same materials and the same criteria, and we all want to be sure the review is as thorough as possible. So then in April, the full FSC meets. We used to be able to say that this is an in-person meeting for obvious reasons. That meeting wasn't held in person uh, in 2020, and it won't be in 2020. 21, uh, we met by Zoom uh, for the first time uh, this year in 2020. During the meeting, the committee discusses the candidates for whom there wasn't consensus uh, among the dyad and the co-chairs. All of those applications are made available to the entire committee, and it's generally a pretty robust discussion. The committee as a whole includes people with many areas of expertise, which allows for a balanced discussion. And of course, anyone who has identified a conflict of interest is asked to recuse themselves uh, during that discussion and vote. Also keep in mind that we only work from the materials in the application. Uh, we don't do any detective work or bring in information from Google searches. We look at the applicant statement, CV, and the sponsor statements. So again, it's really essential that the application reflect the candidate's accomplishments. Um, so at the FSC meeting, discussion is held, a vote is held, and a simple majority of voting members is required to approve. And I'll just emphasize that this, decisions are made on the merits of each application. We don't have a target number or a ceiling. And um, while this is a rigorous review process, as you know, our general focus or general orientation is one of inclusion, not exclusion. The FS, FSC's role are really to facilitate bringing in accomplished nurses who have had a significant impact. Um, I'll just close by noting that what I've described is the process that we've followed uh, for several years. As you've heard, uh, a steering committee has been reviewing all aspects of this process to look at areas for re refinement or, or, or or major change. And you've heard a couple of those uh, changes described. Uh, that's a good thing. It doesn't mean that the current process doesn't work. It means that as the academy has continued to grow and evolve, 
that the review process itself should also be open to evolving uh, as well. And on that note, um, thank you for your time. Thank you all. Um, there have been a couple of questions that have come in while we're talking, and you have the ability in the chat room to pose more questions, and we'll try to uh, cover those in the time that we have now. One of the questions that came in is since the uh, application is going to open in January, is there a lot of changes in the application questions from 2020 to 2021? No, it's the same question. So if you've been working on your application, which has been strongly suggested in this call, as a matter of fact, I'd even go as far to say is if at this point, if you haven't been working on your application, you probably would be better waiting to next year to apply because it really does take a number of months of going back and forth with your um, sponsor to support your application in the best way. But the questions for 2021 will be the same as 2020. Also, uh, there was a question that came in about the examples. And when the application goes online in January, the examples will also be there. So there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes now, getting ready for that application process in um, January. Um, I'm gonna ask this question to uh, you, Linda, and that, that is if someone on the, if you know someone on the committee, does that help influence your application if you already know somebody? So if there is an individual um, who, who's on the committee that you know, that individual on the committee would see that as a conflict of interest and they would recluse themselves. And I don't know if David or Kent would rather um, continue to, to comment on that. I guess I don't know quite if the question is asking about undue influence or not. Yeah, I, 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 let me just comment on that. And, and David, I know you're about to say something too. So. <laughs> I, uh, yes, we are instructed as uh, when we go through our orientation process every year, we have to sign a conflict of interest statement and agree to recuse ourselves if we believe that a, a decision either way would, um, would, would affect us in, in our ability. So uh, yes, we actually leave the room and we don't hear the discussion and um, um, uh, it's, uh, it, it doesn't help at all to know someone on the committee. Um, and if, if I could just clarify, um, literally just knowing somebody or having, you know, an acquaintanceship with them, having worked with them at some point before, um, doesn't necessarily uh, require declaring a conflict of interest. It, it really should be, um, generally, if you're from the same institution, uh, but also if uh, if the individual uh, committee member feels that they cannot be um, objective. So um, lobbying somebody <laughs> would, uh, if, if you lobby a committee member, that's likely to result in their, um, if, in, in their needing to declare a conflict of interest. And, and the committee members really are expected uh, not to uh, consult with people, you know, not to sort of give them um, insider information, not that there is, isn't that much of insider information. So it's, it's really not just knowing somebody. And I think that the committee has sort of gone through this because um, in some years past, um, uh, there's been, I mean, basically in, in some areas of nursing, uh, people may know, <laughs> at least have a passing knowledge of, of lots of other people. So it shouldn't be just if you, you know, met somebody at a meeting or if you once served on a committee together, but truly um, if, there is, um, if there is a conflict. And the goal of course is not to have any undue influence, not, not to bias the process uh, in any way. David, could I add on to that, that um, the, as far as the board goes, there's a firewall really between yeah. 
the fellow selection committee and the board. So it wouldn't help you or anyone to know a board member either because the board uh, has no decision-making authority on um, the class of new inductees. Okay, um, another question that came in is that in reviewing candidates, and I'm gonna ask both David and Linda to comment on this, could you speak more about what makes a CV stand out? Uh, Dr. Scott, want to go first? Sure, thanks, um, Jane. So I think what's important with a, a CV and a resume is the level of detail about the impact that you that a candidate has stated in their narrative. Again, as David mentioned earlier, there's only two documents that the Fellow Selection Committee looks at. That is the narrative application where the um, applicant and the sponsors have provided um, their uh, statements in regards to contribution and impact and the CV where, which then should contain the evidence for that, um, those contributions and impact. So it's, it's having a uh, CV that is readable, that contains the information and the evidence that it demonstrates um, what had and supports what has been stated in the narrative. And I would also say what really probably would stand out to me also is a CV that I have to work harder to find the information that supports it than one that is clearly organized that presents the information that I'm looking for. David. Sure, I'm. Um, I agree. I agree with what Linda said, and I think that the the most helpful CV in this process is one that that really uh, reflects what's in the candidate's statement. So again, focusing on impact um, uh, for for academics, sometimes there's a, a temptation to put together what what you might put forward for. A tenure promotion, et cetera. Um, and some of that, I mean, undoubtedly includes a lot of important things, but um, some of that may be tangential to, to what you're focusing on. So I think, again, focusing on impact and again, looking at this, looking at the whole application, including the CV as a package and just making sure that uh, everything is consistent and the CV again, helps back up what you're saying in the candidate statement. Thank you. David, can I offer an example? And a, just a quick example. Uh, I remember uh, having served on the fellow selection committee and, and reading time after time where a person may have stated something like, I'm a nationally recognized blank, like in heart failure, let's say uh, in cardiology or, or another area. I would look at the CV to see what kinds of indications and evidence, as Linda said, are in the CV to support that. If you're a nationally or internationally recognized expert on something, then I would expect to see that you've had mentors, uh, that you first, first author on papers, that you, you published in uh, places, you've been, you've been, been, you've been in, invited to give keynotes, You've, uh, you've also uh, given peer reviewed presentations at conferences um, and that sort of thing. So uh, if you make a statement, be sure you say how you know that statement to be true. And your CV is the best place for us to, to, to go to that. There, there's, a there's a question that came in, um, how, if we asked our sponsors to blind their statements, or will the, the academy do that? There'll be instructions in the application that shows that the name of the, the sponsor will be on a separate sheet. So that information just will not be sent to the um, committee members in the dyads when they're reviewing the applications. However, let's just say um, like, okay, I was from Cedar sinai and they might, the sponsor wouldn't say, I'm the, you know, I know this person as the chief nurse from Cedar sinai but they could say, I know this individual who I've worked with from a large facility um, on the West Coast. 
So it's the same way when you submit abstracts for conferences and the information has to be blinded. So you speak of things in general terms. You just don't put the names of your documents in there. If, if that shows that to be any um, clearer. I don't know. Any, any other comments on that? Um, uh, the question has come in and I'm gonna um, add uh, David or Ken to answer this one. Applications, do you have to focus on two areas of, in your application or can you focus on only one area? Let me, let me ask David to address that first. And if I have anything to add, I'll be happy to. Sure, I, I think the application does ask about two areas, um, but of, often that can be, how do I put this without sounding too circular, but two aspects of the same area. I mean, I think it really depends on your contributions. If you focused in one particular area, um, should be able to sort of cite two, two different um, aspects of that. And I'm sorry for being so vague. I'm trying to think of, of, of examples and uh, uh, my brain isn't letting me do that right now. <laughs> well, David, let I, me actually, just... if, this is Jane, if I could just say, if there's one thing I've heard David say for the last three years when we've been working together <laughs> is that um, your contributions need to have impact. So maybe you could talk a little bit, David, about what you mean by impact. Sure. So for instance, um, somebody who is, whose work is in, uh, who's primarily a researcher, uh, what, what effect has that had? How have your findings not just been disseminated, but what kinds of changes have they led to? Someone who's had uh, work in policy or that's affected policy, um, how has that either advanced the profession? How has that been uh, implemented by policymaking bodies? Uh, people in practice, and, and you know, this also brings up the, the question that people often ask is, is just being in, in an important role um, enough? So let's say you've got somebody who is a, a, a chief nursing officer for a large health system, merely stating that and that it's a big and well-known institution and that you're the chief nurse uh, is probably not gonna be enough. But if you point to what you've done in that role, you've turned around um, you know, a failing uh, service or you've been able to uh, increase you know, increased, uh, diversity significantly. Uh, again, you, you wanna think about just you know, aside from uh, Aside from just sort of the, the gravity of a specific role, um, how has that affected um, healthcare, nursing? And that might be on a generally on a national basis or might be on a regional basis with clear uh, implications for, uh, for replication throughout the country. Uh, Ken, did you have anything to add to that? I was just going to say uh, when when I when I went up in 2012, um, I have uh, we, we don't all fit in neat little containers and boxes, and I had sort of two areas in my career that I had um, focused on. One was leadership and management, and another was palliative care, and so I I just sort of separated those, and with each one of those, I. I um, gave examples of um, impact on research policy practice and any other um, aspects and tried to quantify as much as I could how others had um, implemented things that I had uh, written about or spoken about. Uh, you wanna, you wanna um, quantify as much as possible and show evidence that um, Others um, are adopting or listening or, or uh, implementing your recommendations. Yeah, I, I would add to that. Um, I had had 28 years in the military um, and then got my PhD and then entered into practice in the civilian sector. So areas for emphasis for me 
were things that I had done in the military with the, on the ambulatory sector, but then in my practice environment as a director of education and practice at a, at a large um, medical center, it was how I had helped incorporate education programs. So it was really kind of two different prongs that, that I went with. But, um, you know, sometimes we, we get academy members that are in practice for a while or they've been in academia for a while and it's how they combine those things. Um, the next question though is what percentage of applicants on average are selected into the academy? And this last year um, it was about 62 percent and that's looking about where we are. We had the most number of applications and David do you remember how many applications we had this last year, you're you're on mute. By the way, trying to multitask, and I'm not good at that. Give me one second, because I did. I pulled this up. Uh, I we had uh, 368 applications and. Um, yeah, 230 were accepted. So that was 62%. Um, that varies, but I think, um, you know, some years it's been higher, some years it's been a little lower. In terms of the rate, um, the, the numbers of applications definitely has continued to increase. Yeah, the, the number of applications we've been getting has been going up about 30 or 40 each time. So I must say, um, as chair and co-chairs, it is a lot of applications to, to read. And um, actually, the, each person on the dyad reads them independently, and each of the chair and the co-chair reads them independently. So um, those applications get quite a bit of independent scrutiny and then discussion. So, um, the, you know, with, with technology, I've been getting your, your questions on my phone because they're coming through too small to read on my computer. Um, let's see, uh, next question. Do, how does, does it make a difference if a sponsor is a new inductee of the academy or someone who has been a sponsor for a long period of time? Well, since the new process is going to be blinded, we won't know um, if the person is a, a new or um, has been in the academy for a long time. So that's one of the things that um, will not be there. The next question, is there a preferred format for the CV? I'm gonna ask uh, Linda Scott if she'll answer this because the preferred format is easy to follow. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Jane. So first of all, I would, there is an example of the CV as, also as a resource uh, on the Academy website. Um, again, to the best of your ability, I would try to make um, review easy for the fellow selection committee and readable. So if you're using a format that is more convoluted, that makes it more challenging, um, I would, I would avoid that. So use the resources that are available on the Academy site. And as was mentioned earlier, making sure that, um, that it does contain the information that supports the narrative statements that you've made. Um, I would also say to make sure that you stay within the page limits that, that are required for a CV so that um, the application is, is not um, uh, does not become ineligible because of, of not following the, the rules for um, the application submission. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, for this next question, is there an example of a measurable outcome in education of students and colleagues? Since we have three educators uh, on the, the panel today, I'll ask, any one of you, if you want to give any example about that, about contributions. 
I would I would give a, a couple of examples. Uh, the first one would be as um, as a as a teacher. I I teach uh, master students and doctoral students and undergraduate students, and I can show in my CV. In fact, I have a little uh, symbol um, where. Uh, students are co-authors with me on publications and presentations. So um, that's a, also a good way to show mentorship of uh, younger generations and, and students uh, um, coming up uh, in our profession. Uh, another way is um, impact is, is also demonstrated by honors and awards. So, um, if you've received uh, uh, awards, a, a teaching award or an advising award or a mentorship award, um, those are all useful in uh, supporting your, your, uh, your claim of, of uh, outcomes with uh, education. And I would probably add also um, looking at educational innovation and programming, and especially if that uh, now programming or innovation now has not only been disseminated, but now it's, it's adopted um, in other uh, programs, um, as well as uh, um, if there's any authorship of, of textbooks or chapters. So those are other ways to uh, demonstrate impact in education. One of the um, questions that's come up from past things is how do we look differently at applications for somebody, let's say that's from a entrepreneurial or um, a practice setting compared with academia. And one difference that comes to mind is we don't expect their, their contributions to mirror the same as in academia of the number of publications and the number of grants that they may have been awarded. Um, sometimes individuals in practice, it's more how have they um, been with their, their budget or if they leading a magnet facility or they've helped their organization increase the percentage of individuals with baccalaureate or master's education. So we do look at the accomplishments differently which brings up a question um, that we just received regarding the role of the sponsor. How does the really the sponsor make their contributions to this application? Um, could, I, could I add to that, Jane, that there's been sure. a lot of questions and comments on, on um, uh, the change um, in blinding the sponsor that I, that I mentioned earlier. But really our reasoning for doing this is, is really to, to focus on the applicant, not the sponsor. So whatever the sponsor writes, it, it should amplify what, uh, what is in your application. And I remember being on the committee and, and reading some sponsor statements and it did not seem like the sponsor knew the applicant very well. And I, I think that if there's a disconnect there, that's a very important um, uh, uh, indicator to the committee. So um, the focus is not on the sponsor, the focus is on you and in your application and what the sponsor uh, says about you. Um, and it, it, it's also very important if they have broad knowledge and specific knowledge about your contribution to nursing. So it takes months sometimes in order to go through some of those things with your sponsor so they can write a very good statement. Yeah, I, I would also like to, to speak a little bit about that is that um, we have seen applications where the sponsor statement, the two statements were almost identical. And it really helps if when you're planning out your application, the sponsor and the individual applying, if they'll talk about which sponsor is going to cover which parts of your application, since there is a you know, the, the word limit for, for those endorsements. So it really helps to, to highlight that. And the applications that I've read that are the easiest to, um, to validate that this person should be invited into the academy, the sponsor really has added some additional details into that sponsorship validating that. Um, yeah, Jane, just 
um, just real quickly, look, I mean, when I say to look at the application as a package, um, you know, the space is limited. And so you want to take full advantage of, of everything. So since, since the committee will be looking at uh, the candidate statement and the sponsor's statement, um, you're, you're, um, you're, waste, <laughs> you're wasting valuable space if you have both sponsors basically saying the same thing. So you, you just, you wanna use the space that you have as effectively as possible. Now, Jane, I've noticed just um, as, as you've been scrolling, I've noticed a couple of questions that ask about um, eligibility of uh, people uh, located in other countries in terms of their National Nurses Association. Um, could I just um, address those real quickly? Sure. Um, one um, was uh, about the UK, where the Royal College of, of Nurses is not currently a member of the ICN. So there is no ICN affiliate um, in that country. And the question was, would, would an individual therefore not be able to apply? Um, but they, well, it, I don't want to answer that uh, in the double negative. Somebody certainly could, and people have applied. Um, if there is no uh, National Nurses Association in your country, uh, then I think it's looked on as a case-by-case -case basis, but that is the professional association in, um, in, in your country and, um, and you know, the option of, of being a member of an NNA uh, isn't currently uh, there. Uh, I also noticed that there was a question of uh, somebody from, uh, Israel, where the um, ICN affiliate is um, uh, is part of the Union Federation, so people who are not uh, working within a unionized settings, so for instance, academics uh, cannot be members. I actually hadn't been aware of that, but I think again we would look at those on a case by case basis. If somebody, uh, because of their role, is not able to be a member of that National Nurses Association. Uh, I, I don't think that we would rule out um, their, their application or being a member. So those are um, sort of exceptions to the rule, if you will. There may be large exceptions, but um, th the idea isn't to create uh, impossible <laughs> eligibility requirements. So we would, look, we would look at those specific circumstances. Uh, kind of along that, um, there's a question about how about if you've been rejected on a previous application cycle, how does that impact your future applications? Um, um, I, I can answer if you like. Um, the answer is it doesn't. Um, we don't take that into account. I know other organizations with the fellowship uh, programs may say you need to wait a year or wait two years. Um, we don't. And we're not aware uh, as a committee uh, if somebody has applied before or how many times they've applied before. And now, now it may be that if you've applied the previous year, there may be some people on the committee that, that happen to remember your, your name, but in terms of that being part of the criteria uh, or being something that's discussed, um, it's just, it's not considered relevant. So. And, and that's one thing that we wouldn't discuss. If we, if, right. um, from a former year, we know somebody has, has applied, that's just not, that's not one of the things that we bring up in the discussion. It's, it's irrelevant. And it, as David said, we don't track, um, you know, like, oh yeah, we, this is the second time this person has applied. And sometimes, you know, um, having um, reviewed, so many applications last year, you, you may see an application that you had reviewed a previous year and the next time it's submitted, the application is a much stronger application and um, they're, they're inducted. So it really is on the quality of the application. So um, as we're coming down for the last few minutes here, I think we've scroll through most of the, um, the major questions that we've been submitted. Is there anything that any of the panel members would like to add a last minute thought as we've been going over this? While, while you're thinking of this uh, in any last minute, I just like to thank Claire Holland, who is in the office and Carolyn Kane, who's in the Academy office, who's the officer of advancement. Uh, the two of them, 
will be helping behind the scenes with this process. Claire um, Holland is the individual who supports directly the fellowship selection committee. So we all have a lot of, uh, those of us that are on the committee have a lot of work with, with Claire, helping to um, take in your applications and prepare them to send to all of us, uh, excuse me, in the, in the drop box. So, um, and as David said earlier, probably we will be doing our um, selection process again um, online this year, unless um, something, we all get vaccinated before April, because that's, that's usually when we'll meet, kind of the, the timelines, as I said, the applications will close the February the 19th, and then um, once all of the applications are in, the whole list comes out to the committee for us to say um, if we have any conflict of interest, and then uh, Debbie and I will make sure that those individuals along with the Academy office don't end up in the dyad to review those. And, um, and then usually, oh, in about mid to late April, the, we will have completed our conversations and our scoring of the documents. And then in, um, those go back into the academy. And then in late April, um, we have our three-day meeting with all of the members going over the applications. And then once that's done, um, the letters go out telling people and their sponsors if they've been accepted or not, usually kind of in the July, I think, time frame. So that's kind of the, the sequence that we work with. And I think this year, the uh, Academy Conference in 21 is in early October, but um, so that's kind of, where it is, and I, I think we all, although there was a wonderful uh, virtual policy council this last year, we're all hoping that maybe we'll get to have an in-person um, conference this next year, we'll, we'll see. Any last minute questions, comments? Well, this is Linda. I'm just delighted to see so many people who are really interested in learning more about the Academy and Academy Fellowship. And, uh, and love the, the diversity of questions as well. And um, just uh, appreciate the opportunity to share information with you. So thank you for again for attending. So we'd also like to thank you uh, for attending. At one point we had over 300 and this is our second webinar. And I believe we had uh, 400 at the other one. So uh, it shows a tremendous amount of interest and uh, David and Jane an overwhelming amount of work. Um, and I wanna thank you for all the work that you put into this. This, this is a lot of hours. And uh, so uh, again, uh, Thank you from the board for your interest and, and uh, we hope to, to see you uh, walk across the stage, even right, if it's right. virtually. All right, thank you everybody.